Okay, so welcome to the last session of the day. Uh, we will start with a keynote by Ashish Kapoor, who's leading autonomous system group in Redmond and working or spending a lot of time with uh, various simulators. I guess many of you have seen or used RSIM in the past and data pre-training or model pre-training and, and in general autonomous systems. All right, thank you. So hello everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk about simulation for machine intelligence. Um, mostly in the context of robotics, but I want to start thinking about going beyond synthetic data. In the last few years, you probably have seen a lot of simulators come out, and the primary use of these simulations have been data generation. But uh, I strongly believe we can actually do a lot more, and let's, uh, let's go through some of these ideas. So first, I mean, just to give you a motivation, you know, simulation has been foundation of modern engineering for a long, long time from medicine to you know, chemical processes, weather modeling, you know, uh, cockpit, pilot training, supply chain, and everything. You know, and until 2016, 2017, it was, you know, for some reason, it didn't actually appear in artificial intelligence. You know, when you think about AI and machine learning, you didn't really talk about simulations. You talked about collecting real data and then fitting models to it, right? So, you know, one insight was that you know, if you think about some of the more recent successes, they are kind of simulators. They are games, sure, but they are emulators, and you know, you're seeing some great successes, but still, these don't translate to some of the real-world problems we are interested in, like, for instance, um, in autonomous systems, in uh, real-world uh, process detection, and things like those. So the idea was, let's create a game, but for real-world, and that was the you know, the genesis of uh, AirSim, and few of you might have seen this. I'll just, uh, well, I, this is not a video anymore, but, but it is what it is. It's a simulation for the AI pipeline in an autonomous agent. So while, you know, we would like to think that this is a simulator for, for robots and things like that, but really, it's really trying to go after the AI pipeline. You know, when you see the world through sensors, you need to make sense of it and take an action. That's the bit that's been simulated a lot in detail. The rest of the stuff is scaffolding, sure enough. But the emphasis in the AI processes, the machine learning pro processes. Um, and if you look under the hood, you know, there are a lot of things going on. It's a simulator, you know, there are vehicles, there's a physics engine, you know, there's an environment, some sensor models, of course there's rendering happening, some scaffolding to collect data. And you know, you can do hardware in the loop, software in the loop, and things like those. Um, but you know, this is, this is very much classical coding. This is basically how you build video games, right? It's, it's, you know, we are looking at the off-the-shelf rendering engines, you're looking at off-the-shelf physics engine, and you created this framework where you can actually do something interesting, right? Um, and of course, you know, there have been a lot of folks use this fabric to create, to generate a lot of, you know, interesting things. So this is, for instance, our collaborators at CMU, and recently they released this data set uh, that was generated using AirSim to, for visual odometry. Right, because you are a robot, you have exact poses of the camera and what the camera is doing in this virtual world. You can actually mount cameras in different orientations and different, different configurations and let it run loose across a variety of environments and collect data at a scale that you have never been able to do it um, in the real world. So again, you know, data generation has been the primary use case, but we want to go beyond that. Right, and here's another example, right? This example is uh, actually uh, folks using machine learning to detect, uh, detect poaching activity in, in African savanna. So the video you're seeing is a real video captured with a drone, and you see those few pixels, the white pixels, so these are elephants and poachers, and the goal is, you know, how do you detect those? Um, again, a key thing that I'd like to point out here is the fact that you need to simulate an IR camera. You know, it's not, not just a regular RGB camera. You need to simulate the imagery being captured through an IR sensor. So now you are going to getting, getting into a realm which is beyond just the games. The sensor simulation component in things like AirSim is what I call the gold because those are the technologies that not a lot of people worked on and suddenly we have the need to actually start rendering the view of the world as they appear from the camera. So again, you know, this was a project that was done with Air Shepherd, which is a nonprofit based out of Seattle, work, work, work quite a bit in, um, you know, um, in Africa, and they were able to use it and start building models that were successful. But one of the things that struck me out is that our ability to create these sensor simulation was very poor. So I'll give you an example. 
right? So this is a, this is a video, right? On the top left, you see um, you know, camera images being captured through a drone as they are flying in the simulation. But we actually need to operate on, on sensor simulations. So on the lo lower left is what the sensor simulation is right now. It is using, you know, uh, again, deterministic routines, our understanding of how physics operates and how, you know, reflectivity of the heat heat happens and how it's been captured. And of course, it's nowhere near realistic. On the left, what you see is basically same phenomenon, but actually being pushed through a neural network, right? Uh, how do you generate these kinds of sensing, right? Now you're actually starting to see these components, these neural modules that start to appear in simulation, which, which are you know, definitely a little bit more realistic than what we could actually do with, with, our, with, our, with our, you know, our traditional way of encoding. So, so again, this is where you know, some, of the, some of the initial thought, uh, you know, thought, thought came. Here is an, uh, another example, which is uh, our collaborators. Uh, let me move forward. Here at Caltech, uh, where they are trying to, again, detect animals ca using camera traps. Again, the problem here is that you know, no, like this kind of images you don't get in wilderness. You're actually getting images in at night with a stop spotlight being shined on a camera, on, a, on an animal in the darkness. And again, you know, what you see here is very different than what actually a sensor would see, and that's an important problem. So one of the insights that we had as we move forward towards the next generation of simulation, uh, this is, okay, is a simulation. You know, you can think of a simulation as a combination of multiple simulations. So let me tell you what I mean by that. So when we think about a quad rotor, you know, which is something that we specialize in our group, you know, we are looking, when we're trying to simulate it, we see quad rotor as a combination of multiple parts. You know, it has an electric motor, it has a propeller, and it has physics, right? Or of course, this drone is not isolated, it's in an environment, so consequently you need to model the weather as well, so the wind gusts and things like those, you know, maybe the snow, maybe lighting changes. The physical environment is also needs to be simulated. And as I said, we want to go, be, um, you know, we, we want to go after the machine intelligence and machine learning problems, so you need to simulate the sensors. So for instance, you have cameras and IMUs and IR cameras and LIDARs and so forth. But when you're thinking about the, the, the machine learning pipeline, you also need to simulate how your neural network or how your perception system is going to operate on. So consequently, you have simulators for those as well, you know, including the delays, for instance, where a neural network operates on a camera, you know, it takes some time, and you've got to simulate all those things if you've got to simulate your real, uh, the AI pipeline. And of course, all this perception goes to a controller or a planner if you're an autonomous system real, and so forth, right? And again, you know, this, is a collection of simulation. A simulator like AirSim is nothing but a collection of simulation. And if you start thinking in terms of neural components, in terms of differentiable components, right? There, if you take all this thinking to an extreme, you, know, you come to a point where every single box here is differentiable, right? It's not, it's not just off the shelf components. And if you can make every single component here differentiable, what can you possibly do? Right? And it turns out that you can do a lot more. And I'm going to walk you a few of the examples of how we are thinking about it. Right? And again, this kind of thinking is not limited to, to you know, our robotic simulators. If you have, for instance, uh, you know, other simulation, other, other, other phenomena that you want to simulate, I mean, there, it's an interesting exercise to actually think about what would the entire differentiable pipeline of simulation can make you do, can enable you to do. Right? All right, so this is, you know, um, I'll just uh, quickly walk through this example. So here, the first thing you could do, of course, is, you know, you can actually train your controller. So when I say that, you know, uh, this is a simulation, imagine the case when your controller and a, and a, and a planner are, are differentiable as well. And of course, you know, in this age of neural network-based control, you can replace them by a neural network and they become differentiable. So consequently, you can, you know, you can, you can learn controllers. So that's exactly what's happening, right? Um, it's akin almost to using your simulation and, and generating the data not randomly, but in a very specific manner to go and train your controller. So this is, you know, this is basically done in AirSim and this is a real robot that's flying through it. 
One of the key questions that everyone asks us is, what about the simulation to real gap, right? And, um, and of course, you know, that's something we think about quite a bit. If everything is differentiable, you can actually come up with loss functions that tries to minimize that, right? You try to minimize the simulation, but actually you can then try to write loss functions that minimize the behavior of the drone, how it would do in the real world, as opposed to just rendering it, right? We don't want to spend all our energy trying to make our simulation as great as possible across all the fronts. You need to be very specific. You know, in this case, we are trying to optimize for the action right and the great thing is that because uh, you know if you if you are looking at things like differentiable rendering you can actually ask the question all right if i see something in the real world how it would project in a simulation how it would look like projection and that's what you're seeing the left uh, the 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 window that you see you know you're seeing the projection of the real world image into how it would appear in simulation so it gives us transparency it gives us whether we believe that the simulation is going to actually work or not all right so that's one example um, you know, folks have done the similar thing. So this is, uh, you know, students at Technion who basically, again, did the same sim to real. You know, no, no training in real, real world. Just took the, took the data, and then you are there, you are operating. You know, they, they were participating in this autonomous uh, driving car challenge, and they were using, using simulation to train their, their models to do that. Again, again, this is, you know, uh, the, the leap here is not yet big. It's very obvious. You're sure, you know, generate data, train perception models. Next step train your, uh, your controllers, right? But can we do more than that? Oh, let's move forward. Okay, so the next thing you can do is imagine, you know, we, I talked about controller, you can have planners as well, and these planners can be differentiable too, right? So imagine the task that I want to go and scan a, a building out there. And uh, sure, you know, you can use, uh, traditional classical um, classical methods, but what if they were parameterized and you could actually differentiate through the whole module, right? Um, well, in this case, you know, just a caveat that we did this project in 2018 and differentiable simulation was not on our radar as well. But we wanted to optimize our plans for, for the mission that we are going to do. And those days we didn't have the liberty of having the gradient, so we use gradient-free methods. So specifically, we used you know submodular optimization to come up with with methods that would you know take take a scene and generate plans so that certain optimization goals were met. So in that case, this case, it was the coverage, it was the details that we could do, right? Uh, but again, you know, going beyond the training data, using your simulation to actually start thinking about the mission and differentiating all these modules and blocks so that you can optimize for the final, final mission. Here is another example, and this example actually uh, is, is, is one of my favorites. And the idea here is that um, you want to solve an MDP. In this case, the MDP is information gathering. You know, you go into a room and you know nothing about it, right? And the goal for the robot is to actually go and gather as much information as possible, right? Um, you know, people have solved this problem in many different ways, but this was a very unique way, which is only enabled if you have simulation. So let me explain what exactly is going. All right, so what we're really trying to do here is trying to come up with, say, a neural network that would tell a robot where to go, given what it has seen in the past. And getting that kind of data, if you have simulation, is actually fairly straightforward. And what you do is you use uh, an imitation learning, call, uh, uh, imitation learning algorithm called Aggravate, where you, where you take an action up to a certain level, and then you ask the question, hey, you know, I have taken this action using whatever I know about the, how I should solve the problem, right? But from now on, you tell me exactly what's the optimal way to do things, right? Because you are in simulation, you can now basically, you know, uh, undo all these masking and all the thing, and you can actually figure out, all right, this is the optimal way to do things if you were there. And that's how you, you collect experiences and on which you can actually train uh, a policy which is trying to imitate an oracle. So theoretically, this amounts to solving an MDP using a simulation, right? So uh, again, there are lots of ways to solve an MDP, but if you had a simulator, this is the way you do it. And this is not possible if you don't have a simulator, right? Um, you know, here is an example where, where basically, you know, you have a desk and the goal is for your camera to go and collect as much information about the, about the desk, and you start with virtually nothing, right? And uh, I'll give you a quick demonstration on how, it, uh, how these kind of things work. 
So again, there are heuristics that people have you know, proposed. So in, you know, this is the occlusion aware heuristic where you know, you're looking at occlusions and have encoded some kind of rules to, to make sure that you can go behind them and look for things. But explore is where you, are, you have learned from simulation. You, know, you have created many, many worlds where similar configurations happen and you use your simulations to help guide you or explore things, right? So it's almost akin to, you know, when you go into a room that you don't know, you have a prior knowledge of how the room topology should be, just because you've seen millions of rooms in the past and you're using the exactly the same kind of things. Of a thing that's, you know, something that's very, just a little bit, okay. Something that's, that I feel very excited about, especially when you're in the simulation world, is our ability to debug machine learning and AI models. We have used simulators explicitly to generate data, but if we have the ability to generate data, you can ask the questions like, you know, what are the data points that give my model a hard time? Right? So in this case, what you have is machine learning model, for instance, that do face recognition, for instance, right? And you are trying to figure out, all right, you know, what kind of faces this thing doesn't work on? And a few years ago, this was a pretty, pretty, you know, pretty big deal, right? And, uh, and all you are doing, again, is some kind of an optimization. This is, again, in 2018. It's gradient-free optimization using Bayesian optimization specifically. And the question you are asking is, what are the examples in the space of all the data generated that I can generate where my model is going to have a hard time? And now you have insights into what are the difficult problems. Here is another example, right? So this is, uh, you know, let me play the video. I think it's more illustrative that way. So what it is, this is, again, um, and imagine an autonomous car trying to detect pedestrians, right? And, uh, you know, and you can see a, basically a pedestrian here. But what I'm actually going to use, you know, this environment to generate a possible, um, you know, configuration of different, you know, different cars and different building layouts. Um, oh, let me see, let me just move forward. Otherwise, this will be robustness. Yeah, here you go. So now what you're doing is basically you are going through all possible configurations where you come up with these situations where these models starts to fail, right? So again, I'm not training a neural network. I am basically doing a for loop, for instance, on top of the configurations so that you can figure out where does it work, where does it fail. Again, if you have a bunch of, you know, if you have a lot of configuration parameters, doing such, such exhaustive search is nearly impossible, right? But if your modules, your rendering modules are differentiable, if you had the ability to search intelligently through the space, this can be a very, very powerful, powerful way to solve things, right? So just, this is just an illustration. Again, you know, um, I'll, I'll move forward and give you some example. In fact, this can be formally specified using what we call the concept of neural fuzzing. Right? So fuzzing is a concept in programming languages where, where you're really trying to figure out the bugs in programs, right? And here, you're trying to figure out bugs in your AI system by asking the questions, where do we believe our program is going to have the, the, the most difficulty, right? The kind of optimization methods, you know, can, can be gradient-based and can be gradient-free. We have done a lot of work in gradient-free. Uh, but if everything is differentiable, this becomes a, 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 a great possibility, right? Here is an example, actually, of using simulation to figure out bugs. And, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is a very specific um, attack on planner. So if you're a robot, you have some kind of a planning component, right? Most of these planning components actually are... Uh, optimization based, so you're solving some optimization problem. And uh, we all know that these, many of these, most of these optimization based methods are iterative. So as in, you know, you're basically following some kind of a gradient. And if your problem becomes ill-defined, you can actually, you will converge, but you don't know how long. And if you're operating a robot in real time, you probably need an answer in 30 milliseconds. So here, you can actually think about an adversarial attack where the adversary has a little bit information about how you solve your, you know, uh, your planning tasks. And it knows that the planning task, like something like obstacle avoidance, is going to depend upon my state. So because it's going to depend upon my state, I can move around, and I can come up to a configuration that's going to make 
life difficult for the optimization-based planner, right? So again, you can encode this as a mathematical objective function, right? And in, in, in the realm that your simulation is differentiable, you have a planner there sitting, right? And you can actually optimize for your own location such that you can then go and attack attack that optimization place planner, right? In this case, you know, we are using a simple um, state-of-the-art planners, and all you're trying to do is you're trying to encode the poor condition number, like some kind of estimate of what the condition number for the optimization is going to look like. And, you know, again, encoded as a mathematical problem, and then you're going after it. Some, some examples, again, you know, some of them are very, very obvious. You are at origin, your destination is zero. The region around, you know, around the bright spot is where if an adversary is, your optimization problem is a little bit difficult to solve, right? Uh, I mean, again, you know, not, uh, not, not very surprising. Um, you know, again, taking the idea of debugging, you know, we know that in computer vision, a lot of folks are building all these big gigantic models, and one of the key questions everyone is asking is, how do we figure out where it fails, right? So in this case, we basically are looking at, you know, differentiable rendering, specifically, you know, Mitsuba uh, coming out of EP APL, for instance. And then you are rendering these objects in many different configurations, right? So for instance, you know, different sizes, different camera angles, different lightings, different texture, different backgrounds. And you know you can ask query again. Where do I? Where where, where where does the problem lie? So here is one simple case study that I'd like to highlight. Um, you know you can actually, you know, start asking what are the important components, you know, that let you let, let you identify when a mug is a mug. So for instance, in this case, um, you know, we generated many different configurations of mug, and uh, by aggregating the results. You know, it kind of gave you a hint that probably, you know, what's inside the cup is for some reason far important than what's outside, and why is the case, right? So the first thing you can do, again, you know, you're in the differentiable rendering space, you can go ahead and you can instantiate different mugs with different, different liquids. One is empty, one is water, coffee, and so forth, right? And again, you know, this is basically a visualization of some of the results. So when you have coffee, your algorithm actually identifies as a coffee, but when it's water, it's basically saying that it's a bucket. Where with milk, it's saying, uh, uh, you know, it's saying a cup or a pill bottle, right? And so the content is actually is more <laughs> important than the shape itself, and that should give you a red flag that, all right, I should go back and probably try to identify some things. Again, this project is open source, so if you just look for you know, 3DB, search for it, you, know, you can download it, you can start playing with your own, own machine learning models right away. Um, you know, as I said, like we do a lot of uh, stuff uh, you know, besides just computer vision. So in this case, you know, we were uh, we were designing robotic systems to do stratospheric modeling. So in this case, you have a weather balloon um, that's going to sense. Uh, stratosphere, so this is, you know, layer between 60,000 feet and 100,000 feet. It turns out that it's a very important layer and you, we don't have much active sensing. So you can actually send these sensors. And the policy of these sensors on how they are going to sense, you know, again, if you have everything in simulation, you can actually differentiate for that. You can differentiate for those parameters on how should you be deploying the sensors in the atmosphere to get, get maximal information, right? Um, uh, you know, I will, uh, um, you know, I'll, I'll finish with a couple of uh, examples that, that I think, you know, you might find very interesting. So as I said, we are an aerial robotics group. That's one of the primary missions. So one of the things that we've been looking at is uh, auto land capability. So, you know, eVTOL revolution is, you know, at our doorstep. I mean, if you're following that, you know that these things are, uh, these things are moving at a very rapid pace. And one of the problems is going to be safety in foggy conditions. So for instance, you know, what I have over is how your airport looks when it's foggy. And humans, pilots, you know, sure, they are using autopilots, but these autopilots are very heavily instrumented. They are not camera-based. There are a lot of radio beacons out there that, that's helping you guide through that very precisely, and it's a very reliable system. As, uh, as these things, you know, proliferate throughout the world, it's going to be very difficult to actually instrument at that level. Each of those instrumentation is probably a couple of million dollars, right? And if you're going to have, you know, 100,000 of these things in a country, you are not, there's no budget that exists. So you've got to be thinking about 
reliability. Very likely, these are going to be perception-based sensors, and uh, we got to start thinking about how to make them more reliable, right? And of course, we are using neural networks, right? If you're computer vision doing any kind of detection, you are probably going to use neural networks, and they are very fragile. That image probably you've seen 100 times. If you're in the, um, in the field, which is image plus any imperceptible noise makes your machine learning system break, right? And, uh, you know, we are going to actually use that property but invert it. What I'm going to ask the, for the question is, you know, given a neural network, how should I change my environment so that the neural network can detect these things more easily, right? So I'm not training a neural network. I am instead saying that you have given me a neural network. Now, how should I be designing my landing pads so that these things, these things, uh, you know, uh, these things work, work, uh, work robustly? And again, if your simulation is completely differentiable, you can differentiate for the parameters of your physical environments. In this case, what you do is you take the texture of the landing pad and you differentiate through the parameters and do a gradient descent to come up with, you know, come up with landing pads that are, you know, that are physically realizable as well as more robust to the given model. So here, here is the example, and of course, you know, the landing pad on the top is, looks very funky, <laughs> very hippie, but it's just a proof of concept that, you know, actually you can do these things. Uh, one of the key questions is, are these things physically reliable? Sure, there's one thing to do in simulation, what about the real world? So what we actually did was, you know, we, we trained these patches that would help us detect many of these objects. You know, so the, you, you can see the patch on top of the car, on top of the airplane. These are stickers, small stickers, but they are basically being optimized through this differential rendering pipeline where you are asking, all right, I want to, what kind of patch should I be put on, putting on objects so that they become a little bit uh, easier to be detected? Right? Um, you know, we talked about texture. The next thing is shape, right? So this is the, the work that we are, we're going to work with Pascal on. And again, thinking about, you know, some, uh, you know, some mission where you have the ability to optimize for shape as well, right? So where we can, you know, borrow some of the, some of the techniques that, uh, that Pascal and his team have been doing. So the idea is, again, instantiate the entire simulation in a differentiable way. So that includes your dynamics, that includes your planning, that includes your perception, that includes your wind fields, that includes, you know, um, you know other, other aspects, sensing, for instance. And then ask the question, how should I be changing the shape of my airplane together with other parameters that we might be interested in, for instance, the controllers jointly, and, um, and, and, and try to come up with something that's reasonable, that's, uh, that's physically realizable. Right, so I will, you know, end with uh, with a couple of very, very, very practical use cases. You know, simulation has been very, you know, it's been very useful for us to sort of reorient our perspective on machine intelligence system. I think one one place where simulation right now can be imminently used is, for instance, monitoring of these AI models. So this is basically a farm, and you have, you know, sensors. And uh, you know you are trying to do precision agriculture. For a farmer, ability to see things and ability to flag things as they go wrong or right is a very important thing. And so we, you know, there is a huge effort within uh, within my team to actually start thinking about these as uh, important visualization tools. And of course, a lot of questions here are beyond machine intelligence. They 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 you know entail usability, they entail interpretability, and 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 those kinds of things. And that's an area that's completely. I would say, you know, um, uh, underexplored. Um, and finally, you know, I'll, I'll end with uh, one of the deployments where we did with, uh, uh, with Bell helicopters at CES a year and a half ago, where they were using, you know, uh, simulations like AirSim to do machine intelligence, but also monitoring. So this is basically a display where, you know, they had in AirSim of a system which was physically created on the floor. And, uh, and you know, simulations were being used to actually control, train, and, and, uh, and track these systems, right? So with that, I'll, uh, I'll stop, and I hope it gives you some food for thought on how we can think about you know, simulation in a differentiable way and how we can start affecting the machine intelligence pipeline. Thank you. Okay, thank you for a fantastic talk. Uh, do we have any questions?
So maybe let me ask you uh, first. Uh, so you know we've seen a lot of success for simulations or simulated data. Uh, whatever it's about reinforcement learning, where you need zillions of episodes, when it's about situations when it's difficult to get the accurate ground through like dense depth, dense optical flow. There, you know, I don't think anyone doubts about simulated data or, you know, we've seen it multiple times to be to be really the key thing to actually achieve really high accurate models or solve the problem. But we've seen a bit less of it, you know, when it comes to object detection and these tasks. What do you think is the is stopping the community from a little bit more exploring this? Yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, there's always a trade-off between where the data exists versus not. But object detection, for instance, I mean, people have spent decades trying to curate a set of data and benchmarks. And uh, I think eventually we will get there. I mean, we do see that when you're going after a very specific problem, so for instance, in the poacher detection, right? Off-the-shelf systems, you know, would, I mean, even the data didn't exist. I mean, the team parked themselves in African savanna for three months and all they could get is 3,000 frames, right? So the lack of data will guide you towards simulation naturally. Um, in, in many of the cases where data doesn't exist, simulation is the only choice, but where the data exists, I think still there are established benchmarks, so people gravitate towards that. But I think, you know, this will, this will, this will change slowly. Oh. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Thanks a lot for the amazing talk and work. And um, one question that you sort of uh, addressed with uh, the robots are becoming more embodied and you want to simulate the perception and so on. The more you actually want them to do, say, talk of uh, interaction, the more you need to simulate like uh, contact forces and so on. And eventually you end up sort of simulating the entire world, right, if you want to do everything. So um, where do you see current limitations or the potential for simulation to sort of generalize to the open world? Yeah, no, absolutely, it's a great question. So the thing is, you know, if you really truly want to simulate the entire universe, you should probably start at the, at the atom level or probably even there. And there is an abstraction where you got to sort of say, all right, you know, rest, I need to believe that, you know, my, my current code can do that and I'll build simulation on top. Right? That abstraction, that level of abstraction depends upon you know, many factors, including your ability to compute, your ability to model things. Sometimes there are processes we don't even understand. And you know, there are many, you know, many processes, in, for instance, in turbulence modeling that, that I think are the cutting edge of research we ourselves don't understand, let alone you know, code it. So, um, you know, the, the envelope of simulation will really depend upon your, our capabilities, our computational abilities, and uh, our need to sometimes solve the problem, right? Some of the most difficult sol uh, simulations I've seen were actually invented 30, 40 years ago because simulation were the only way to go, right? And, uh, and again, you know, it's, a, um, it's one step at a time. I think, uh, you know, some of like contact forces, still very difficult. Right, for various computational reasons, things like those. Your need for real-time simulation versus, uh, you know, if something you can do offline. I mean, all of those things will factor into account as you build, build uh, methods to do these things. Okay, if we do not have any other questions, let's thank the speaker. All right.